The Sinkfield Cup 2022 tournament is over. We're going to talk a little bit about the cheating scandal and Magnus withdrawing first. We're going to go through all four of the classical games. And then we're going to go through the two tiebreak games to determine who was the final winner. All right, so first, let's take a step back and just talk about cheating in over the board chess and Magnus withdrawing. This is kind of an unprecedented event with the world champion dropping out of the tournament. And there's been these allegations that Hans has been cheating, both online, which he has now admitted to, and over the board, potentially. I think this is something that we can all learn from as a chess community, and the arbiters and tournament directors in particular should definitely be taking notes and corresponding with each other, trying to figure out how can we prevent these types of cheating scandals from happening in the future. And I think there's a lot to be learned in that sense. So if you go back the last couple decades, really cheating over the board is a rare thing. Not many players attempt it. Not many players are caught. And when players are caught, it tends to be like very obscure planning or different things to even be able to cheat over the board. Um, but each time there is a case where someone's caught cheating over the board, we need to learn from it and try to detect those methods in the future. So one of the things that came out um, during this tournament is some people went back and analyzed some over the board results from Hans and a striking result was that when he had live DGT boards during his games, his performance rating was much higher than when he didn't have DGT boards broadcasting his games live. Now, I haven't gone back and verified this data, um, so I don't know for sure if that's true, but the reason I bring that up is to say we need to be thinking about this when we broadcast DGT events. Um, Make sure there's no way that a spectator can relay moves or information to a player. So one thing St. Louis did was they added that 15-minute delay on the broadcast. That's one example of an anti-cheat measure we can use when games are broadcast live. So we just need to keep learning from these things and trying to keep the game as pure as possible when it comes to over the board. And hopefully we are going to hear more information soon from Magnus, from the St. Louis Club, even from chess.com um, or FIDE. What was really going on here? Why did Magnus actually withdraw? Um, it would be nice to have a little bit more information on this before we just see these players playing in more events and not addressing the elephant in the room. All right, so that's the end of that. A lot of drama, um, but it's brought a lot of attention to the chess world too from people outside of uh, usually being fans of chess. All right, so first we have Ali Reza against Yana Um, This is actually wrong game. MVL against Ali Reza. And what I'm going to do is go through these games pretty quickly. We'll start with the opening, and then we'll kind of look at the chart and hit on any major points. So we see a Roy Lopez with bishop to b5. Knight f6, this tends to be the Berlin defense. And this is kind of the... One of the main lines of the Berlin, um, where white does get this pawn on e5, but it's a quiet line. So this is not the queen trade line of the Berlin. This is the line where it's symmetric, but white just has a little bit more activity. It looked just like an extra developing move or two, but not enough to claim a huge advantage. So at this point, it's around 0.25 according to the engine. This is pretty standard still. We're looking at 180 games. And let's look at the chart. 98.9 accuracy to 99.6. Not a lot happened in this game in terms of players playing for the advantage. And look at the clocks. Hour 37 to hour and 38. Ali Reza pretty much just needed this draw to secure the Grand Chess Tour Championship. He had the most points in the tour. MVL seemed content to just play for the draw be done with this event. Um, Ali Reza was also tied for first going into this round for the Sinkfield Cup. So he's definitely happy for a draw. These players just traded everything, started repeating. Draw agreed. Now, if Jan Napomniachi can win his game, he can pass Ali Reza in the standings to win the Sinkfield Cup. Ali Reza would still win the full Grand Chess Tour, though. All right, now we got Mamadyarov against Aronian. 
Let's take a look at the opening. We see a Nimzo Indian, Queen C2, we've seen this before. And this transposes into sort of like a Carlsbad structure where there's these four pawns for black against the two no C pawn and the D pawn. This is called the Carlsbad structure. Very common. One of the most common pawn structures in chess. Now we see c5. This is accepting an isolated queen pawn, so these two pawns tend to trade off, leaving black with the isolated queen pawn. We're still following 150 games. And here we're getting down into rare territory. 10 games. The imbalance is both kings are in the center. Uh, bishop pair for black. And white is currently up one pawn, but it's double attacked. Queen d2. And the analysis is saying 0.2 here. If we look at the chart, we get a 98.4 and a 98.6. So again, Super GM's battling it out over 90 minutes on the clock. These guys are either still in theory, or they're probably for sure still in theory, but they also seem content to just trade down. Um, we do see opposite side castling, which can sometimes lead to more aggressive games. But really, neither side makes a mistake here, and then we just start to see everything swap off. The classic rook and pawn endgame, trade, trade. And neither side really has anything to play for at this point. Too much time on the clocks. These guys are too strong. Draw agreed. You can see why we're going through these games a little quicker today. All right, now we have Wesley So against Lanier Dominguez Perez, both from the United States. I don't know if they're both playing in the U.S. Championship. Hopefully they are. Um, but Hans is going to be in that tournament as well. Here we get a Queen's Gambit accepted. We don't see this too often, just taking immediately on c4. It's not a good opening to play for the win is black, but it's a very symmetric opening, and it has high likelihood of a draw at the top level. Queens come off, and look at this. This is complete symmetry almost. The pawns are all on the same files. Black has played a6. White is castled and put the rook on d1. So white's up a couple moves in development here. And if you look at the stats, white wins 12%, 84% draw, 5% for black to win. Analysis says right around 0.4. If we look at the review, 98.6 to 99.2. Neither side was able to get much. Pieces start trading. Go to the end game. We've seen this before. Same color bishops, and like this is something to learn from. You want your pawns on the opposite color of the bishops, so both players are putting all their pawns on dark. They want to make sure that the light squares can control the opposing king. Not enough to play for. Dead draw. So we've seen three draws, and now we come to Jan Napomniachi against Hans Niemann. Jan does not want a draw in this game. He wants to win and win the London or the Sinkfield Cup, excuse me. We get an English opening. It's kind of a reverse Sicilian with the pawn on e5 and the pawn on c4. See d4 by Jan. Let's toggle on the opening tab. Because e takes d goes from over 200 games to only 11 games. And if we click on it, we do see Hans played this as white against Levon Aronian. Hans played this as white against Alexei Serrana. So it appears that Hans has a pretty good understanding of this line, and he's playing it from the black side. So very interesting to see him here play e takes d4 against his own system. Let's go back to the analysis. Queen takes d4. Look at this space that Jan has. What's the counterplay for black? Black has a little bit more solid of a pawn structure, possibly, right? This pawn's up on c4, black still has a d pawn, but currently Hans is very passive. He needs to un unwind these pieces a bit, and this is a good way to do it. Knight f6, threatening to take, put the bishop here. So now Jan cashes in that kind of space advantage and lead and development advantage to go for the bishop pair advantage. Hans is developing naturally, both knights out, bishop is ready to come out. g3. I like what Jan's doing here. This bishop runs into this c-pawn. 
Even though the computer says e3 is best, I think Jan is trying to play the long game. He wants to play for the win here. This is a nice strategic move. Tucking the bishop onto the Fianchetto square and just giving him that long-term pressure to go with the bishop pair advantage that he has. And at this point, it's a little weird when you have the Fianchetto with a bishop out here on g5. Because after h6, you can't drop the bishop back safely. So now... Um, Jan is cashing in that bishop pair advantage and switching it over to a pawn structure advantage. So queen takes, 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 and we see these ugly pawns for black. Isolated h-pawn, isolated f-pawns, doubled f-pawns. Three pawn islands for black, one here, two here, and three over here. Only two pawn islands for white. d5 by Hans. And now we get this interesting trade of of minor pieces where all of a sudden black has one, two, three, four pawn islands to white's two. One, two, three, four, five pawns are all part of doubled or tripled pawns. And the engine's saying 0.27. So very slight advantage for Jan. Can he go for a positional grind here against Hans? Both players have a lot of time on the clock. Inside castle. Hans gives this pawn back. This is a really common idea when you have ugly pawns like this just throw one up and trying to ruin your opponent's pawns a bit. That's what Hans does. At first glance, it looks like bishop takes a2 would be a good move, but there's pawn to c4, and that bishop is hard to get back into the game. So king e7 played, king c2, c4, rook b2. I like what Jan is doing here. He's keeping these pawns on dark away from this bishop, and that's going to encourage Hans to put his pawns on light squares which get in the way of the bishop. This is solid. This was utilizing the pin of the pawn. But how is Jan going to try to increase his advantage here? Here's a small mistake by Hans. The strongest move now is pawn to a4. And at first glance, it looks like bishop takes c4 is a good move. After king to b2, the bishop is pinned, though. It's a little uncomfortable. Bishop d5. Rook takes, bishop takes in the corner, on to e4. This is just getting crazy. If bishop takes e4, there's pawn to f3 with a fork. And the bishop has trouble getting back into the game, I guess. So pretty deep line, but that would have been the strongest move in the position for Jan, right around a 0.9 advantage. Instead, he plays king back to b2, rook to e5. Pawn to e3. So he's just going for this solid play again. Expect Jan to try to use these pawns, maybe even sacrifice, to try to open up Jan's pawn structure. All right, we'll go through this a little bit quicker. We see Hans also wants his pawns on dark squares, so both sides want the pawns on dark with this bishop on light. And this was a mistake by Hans. So the eval here is 1.3. Han's best move is to play king to e7. I think the reason king to e7 is so good is because this rook is trying to come over this way. So let's say king e7, rook h8, bishop f5. Um, it hits this rook. When the rook moves, let's say rook to b2, there's rook to a3 check. This is getting a little bit weird. Rook to b3 has to be played, the a2 pawn drops, and there's no time to take this pawn. In the game, rook to a3 check was played, king b2, the rook moves, and now rook to h8 is extremely strong because the king guards a2. So that check on a3 actually brought Jan's king to where it wants to be because when bishop f5 is played, now the rook can move. So here it's a 2.5 advantage. Jan is cruising on, in this game. He's looking to play for the win. Rook a4, a3. There's no rook to b4 check. And this pawn is defended comfortably twice. If bishop takes, there's pawn to f3 kicking the rook, and that bishop is going to die in the next move. f5 played. Computer is thinking two and a half pawns for white. Rook takes h6 is the top move. And Jan does not go for it. Really surprising. I don't know why he didn't go for this. Rook takes h6. He must have felt that Ali Reza was getting too much counterplay, swinging that rook back around to the g 
from the G8 squared over to the B file. But that was the chance to, to get a big advantage. Instead, he plays rook to b8, and now Hans is back in that draw territory. Rook a6, king c2, rook to b6, offering the rook trade. And Jan is running out of ways to play for an advantage. You can see there's a lot of shuffling going on. Goes Puts the rook back on h8, but it's a little bit too late, because now Hans reorganizes his pieces. Actually, king f6 would have been a really nice move here. King f6, if rook takes pawn, king g7, rook h5, pawn f6. This rook is stuck over here. It's trapped on the h5 square. Instead, bishop d7 played. And here, rook to a8 is the best move. This is just getting strange. Um, obviously, rook takes h6 would have been better a few moves ago, but right now, it's defended. So knight to b3, bishop to a4. Really strong move by Hans. And after knight takes, there's rook to d1 check, rook to d2 check, and there's no way out. Force perpetual. So nice tactics there by Hans to find this defense. And the problem is, if you don't play knight takes c5 as white, this is going to get traded off, and you're just in a drawn rook and pawn endgame. So nothing that Jan could do here to play for the advantage at this point. But if we look at the chart... Big missed opportunity. He was close to plus three right around this point of the game. Needed to find that rook takes h6. That was his way to play for the win. All right, so Jan Napomniachi, Alireza Ferugia tie for first place. They have a two game rapid tie break. Here's the first game. We see a Catalan structure. I love the Catalan from the white side. This is a main line. And the idea with the Catalan is you want to utilize this bishop on the long diagonal to try to play for an advantage. And if you can, you would like to play e4. But in this case, Ali Reza has both bishop and knight defending the e4 square. So it's dynamically pretty close to a balanced game at this point. This bishop could head to d5. Maybe pawn goes up to c5. Trades off for d4 and black's able to neutralize any sort of advantage white has. This bishop is already doing a pretty good job neutralizing the g2 bishop, which is usually white's best piece in the Catalan. There it is, bishop d5, bishop e4, and sometimes in these lines you can actually just have repetition, like the queen goes to c4, you repeat, instead queen c1. And this is something that you'll see quite a bit in the Catalan too. The bishop takes on c3, Alireza gives up the bishop pair, but it's for strategic reasons. It's because this bishop doesn't have anywhere to go over here. Like if it comes back onto g5, and we just talked about this in the other game, the bishop out here on the dark squares with this kingside being cut for white runs out of moves very quickly. So this whole trade in h6 is able to just get Ali Reza that much closer to an equal position, trying to trade things off. So now we're in an endgame. Material's dead equal. This is a pawn, backward pawn on a half open file. Actually, it's not quite a backward pawn yet, but half open file. And this half open file hits a very solid D pawn. So you could claim an extremely small advantage for white at this point. E5, trying to trade off uh, white's big center pawn. This was a small mistake. Supposedly D5 is best, but queen D5 played. D6, queen back, queen's trade. And I kind of like what Ali Rez is doing here. He's playing for a lot of space. Both rooks are active. And this knight is eyeing b3 and c4. This pawn on b6 is solid. Just everything is solid by Ali Reza. Jan's position feels a little bit shakier now. Like, what does the rook on a2 do? What is the knight doing? But now we see this aggression backfires slightly. Pawn to d5 is a really good reply. It's found by Jan. If rook takes d5 is played, rook takes b6, and white gains the advantage. So black needs to keep that b-pawn guarded. e4 check, and white would love to play c4 himself, so Ali Reza plays it on c4. But now we see this doubling on the b-file, and all of a sudden, either Ali Reza has to play defensive, the move like rook to b8. Active defense, though, is the best defense. Um, the engines have kind of proven that. Chess players have known that for quite a while now. So what does Ali Reza do? He plays rook takes d5. I think that's the better move. You need to play active here. He gets both his rooks on the open d file. 
Now he offers a rook trade. If he can get to just a single rook and pawn in game, those are good chances for a draw. Okay, so now Jan has the initiative again. Double attacking the C pawn. And he's trying to open up this pawn structure so that his knight can attack e4. Gonna create some weaknesses. But it's still very close to draw territory. And this gets interesting because Ali Reza has fumbled a little bit, especially with not a lot of time on the clock. And this is a raft game, he has one minute. He's fumbled some very basic endgames in the past. So Jan knows this. And they're going into this line that should just be a dead draw. But they reach uh, a Rook and Pawn versus King position right here. Jan wins the Pawn and plays Rook to d4. Ali Reza takes it. Takes King here, King here. But right here, for some reason, he goes King to e4. And he needs to get the King backwards. And the commentators kind of like gasp for a second, like thinking, Oh boy, Ali Reza is not going to blow this draw, is he? But he seems to know the technique. Jan doesn't play too many moves to try to trick him. Draw agreed. So, draw in the first game. They have one more tiebreak game in Rapid. If this game is still a draw, then I believe they go to the Armageddon game. So, we have an English with G3 by Ali Reza. E4. And coming up here, there's a strange move by Jan. Knight to A6. This is a mistake according to the engine. And if we look at the opening database, there's only three games. Um, I'm looking for high rated players. Gelfand and Arkiev from 2017. But this is not a common system and we're not seeing super GMs play that uh, extremely recently except this one game. So I don't know if Jan saw that game and that was his inspiration, but the computer did not like this move. And it's kind of on Jan to figure out, is there a way that I can show that this is actually a good idea? So now we get this trade. It's the bishop pair for white, and Jan plays knight to c5, trying to attack on the light squares. But Ali Reza finds this cool idea, pawn to c4, kicking the queen. Queen to h5 is the best reply. This is not an easy move to see. The problem is for white, after queen to h5, you would love to take on e4 and take the queen at the same time, but you can't do both. So that's why queen to h5 is a good move. If queen takes h5, there's knight takes d3 check. And if d takes e, there's queen takes d1 check. But Jan misses this move. He plays queen to e5, and now Ali Reza gets to take e4 without worrying about queen takes d1 check. And after knight takes, he castles. So Ali Reza has the bishop pair here, and black center is a little bit shaky. These knights are superfluous, they attack each other. The queen's out in the open, and this king still needs to get castled. So he first plays c5, kicks the knight back to b3. Um, there was a pin here, so knight goes back to b3. Knight to b5 was discussed by the commentary team, but I think this is the strongest move. Castle finally, on to f3, the knight goes back. Now we see e4. This is kind of Ali Reza's thing. He starts pushing the pawns, gaining space, making it uncomfortable for black. Like, look at this knight. Attacked once, guarded once. Queen's kind of out here in the open. Bishop doesn't have a good home yet. This pawn's attacked. So it's getting a little bit uncomfortable for Jan. The best move is knight takes c4, and f4 is the reply. So I think Jan was getting a little bit nervous here, seeing this f4 come up, kicking the queen. Pawns keep rolling. If this pawn gets to e5 in combination with that bishop on the long diagonal, that doesn't look fun for black. So in this position, he plays queen to e7. And all of a sudden, he says something in Russian. Alejandro said it was a curse word because he just realized that he blundered the whole piece. Pawn to e5 played. If queen takes e5, bishop to f4, it's the queen, it's the knight. So it's a double attack on the knight. Black is completely busted. So Jan had 11 minutes here. He spends two minutes trying to figure out what's the best way to lose a piece. He goes for knight takes c4. Uh, Ali Reza gets the knight on f6. Plays queen d5. Remember this knight still guards a1. It's the queen very active. Wins the c5 pawn. Puts his pawn on f4. This is solid. On to f5. Just awesome technique by Ali Reza. Kicking the bishop, which has the job of guarding the knight. So now Jan's in another tough spot. He plays b6. Ali Reza keeps calm. 
queen c7, rook c8. Queen takes a7 is the strongest move, plus 8. But he plays back queen f4, plus 6. Bishop moves, and now queen trade offer. Jan goes for it because there's just nothing better. This bishop is also under attack. Take, take. Rook d8, bishop f4. Knight f3, and he reroutes this knight to e5, which threatens knight c6, hitting the rook, eyeing this square, which is a fork, rook and king. These pieces are slightly loose. They're not really doing much down here. Bishop goes back, rook c1, these rooks trade. Knight to g6. Pesky knight lurking around this king. There are bishop to d5 check ideas if the rook can't take. And that rook sinks into c7, hitting the a pawn. This is game over. Napomniachi's had enough. He resigns. So Ali Reza, Grand Chess Tour champion and Sinkfield Cup champion, 19 years old. He's right around that. He was already over 2,800. Um, so I think, you know, even though there was this whole scandal with Magnus leaving the event, a lot of attention on Hans Neiman, hopefully one of the big takeaways from this event is just how well Ali Reza played. He had a lot of good games. Um, Played aggressively, kind of kept that same style, but I think he's also incorporating a solidness to his aggression. Um, we saw in the candidates he was a little over-aggressive. I think he's toned it down just a notch and showed a little extra maturity when playing these highest players in the world. And it's going to be really interesting to see how he does coming up in the next year or so. Can he get back over that 2800 mark? And maybe in the next candidates he'll be ready to go to become the next challenger for the World Championship. So congrats, Ali Reza. Hope you guys enjoyed the Sinkfield Cup recaps, and I will see you in the next video, which is most likely going to be back to instructional content. Have a good day.